So welcome everybody. Uh, this is Zero Runtime Exception Since 2015, Elm in production. I'm Richard Feldman. Uh, so I work for a company called No Red Ink. We make software for English teachers. And uh, back in 2013, when I joined the company, we had this sort of smorgasbord of front-end technologies. We had like a little bit of Angular, a little bit of Backbone, some jQuery, just a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, then React came out. And uh, we started using it. We just like introduced this a little bit of React to our stack and said, like, okay, we're just going to use this on one part of one page and just see how it goes. Just a little experiment. And the experiment was successful. We liked it. We were happy with it. It kind of grew and grew and grew. And then 2014, React sort of took over. It, it became the dominant paradigm of our front end. We were pretty happy with it. Until we got to a project that sort of took a long time. It took a lot of iterations. So one of the things that we really value is giving our students a really good, authentic experience. So we had this interface that where the goal was to teach them active voice and passive voice. And we took our React app out to a classroom and tried it out. And uh, unfortunately, it di didn't succeed. Like The students weren't getting it. It wasn't effective at teaching them. And so we said, OK, we'll go back to the drawing board and we'll revise this. We need to make a lot of revisions, a lot of heavy revisions. And uh, what we were finding was that it was just taking a long time. Like We would break all of our tests. We'd have to go back and rewrite a bunch of stuff. Things would crash. And before we could get it out for the next iteration, it, it was just a, a very lengthy process. So, then we took it back and, and got some more feedback, had to go back to the drawing board, iterate again. And all this time, I'd been working on Elm on the side for a side project I'd been doing. And I'd had a very different experience with this type of revision, where I had the Elm's compiler helping me out. And I was finding that in Elm, when I made big changes like this, it would take a lot less time. And by the end of this whole experience, I thought, man, if I had just said, let's do this in Elm instead of in React, this whole process would have taken less time and the resulting code would have been more maintainable, even after accounting for how long it would have taken to ramp everybody else on the team up on Elm. So I said, well, that was a mistake. So in 2015, I said, let's just introduce a little bit of Elm to the code base and just see how it goes. Same thing we did with React. Just try a little experiment. So we did. And we liked it. It, it once again worked. It, it was nicer. It solved some of our pain points. And so it kept growing and growing until by the end of 2016, Elm became the dominant paradigm of our front end. So the title of this talk, uh, comes down to a little uh, technology that we use called Rollbar. So Rollbar is a library that catches JavaScript runtime exceptions. So we just have it running. We've had it running for a long time now. Um, and basically, every time something crashes, something throws a runtime exception in the browser for one of our end users, Rollbar catches it and reports it to us. So we find out about it. So we can go and, and find out what went wrong. And so we do this triage where every week somebody goes through Rollbar and just checks out where all the bugs came from. We file issues and you know figure out what to do about them. So we noticed something interesting when we started introducing Elm, which was that we weren't getting any runtime exceptions for our Elm code, only from our legacy JavaScript code. And this kept being true longer and longer until the point where I was asked to speak here in October 2016. We, we still had not seen any. So the title of the talk is No Runtime Exceptions Since 2015, which is actually to say yet, like ever. It's, it, it just had never happened. Um, but if you think about it, there's an interesting timeline situation here. And, and you can kind of backtrack and think about what happened leading up to today. So October 2016, I get asked to speak. At that point, we have zero runtime exceptions in production. But like, that's true then. Today is March 2017. So I had to decide on the title of the talk between then and now, not really knowing what was going to happen in the interim. Like, it's entirely possible that I'm standing up here today, and uh, what I'm about to say is, well, that was true back then, but uh, you know. Things happen. Um, so I was sitting there debating, like, what should I title the talk? I was like, I think that'd be a really cool title for the talk, but, but like, w what if it doesn't work out that way? What if we finally get our first runtime exception between then and when I have to go on stage, having now committed to this title? So but I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Um, so this really kind of came down to confidence, right? I was, I was asking myself this question. is like, is this really what I want to use as the title of my talk? And I was thinking, like, how much confidence do I have that this is not a fluke? Like, that this is just like, Actually, this is normal, and like, yeah, probably this is just going to keep happening. Um, and I thought, yeah, I have a lot of confidence that's true. So yeah, let's go with it, as you know, because that was the title of the talk. So what happened? So this, these are our current production numbers. So this is uh, no red ink in production. So we have uh, over 2 billion questions answered. So students are answering millions of questions per day. That'll probably be at 3 billion the next time I put this slide up. Um, uh, about 100,000 lines of Elm code running in production since 2015. Well, well we didn't have that much back then. But, but, um, and today, the total number of runtime exceptions we've gotten since we introduced it for all time is still zero. So we got there. <laughs> um, 
So you might be thinking, okay, okay, so like, what does that mean, zero runtime exceptions? Okay, we know that it like, literally means that there were no runtime exceptions, but like, why? Is that because Elm just swallows runtime exceptions, got a giant try-catch around everything? Like, there, there are lots of ways you could achieve this, right? Um, fortunately, the answer is no. Uh, it's, it's much better than that. It's actually that we got no runtime exceptions because Elm has an awesome compiler that just catches all the problems that could lead to runtime exceptions up front. So to give you an example of uh, how this works, let me introduce you to Ellie. So Ellie is a program that is sort of nominally like um, JS Fiddle for Elm, um, but it, it does some cooler stuff than that. So this right here is some Elm code on the left, um, and uh, what it's causing to render on the right is this chart. So this is the Elm code on the left, and it, uh, Ellie is compiling it and then using it to render this code on the right. So Elm compiles to JavaScript. It's a functional programming language. Um, so what's happening here is when I make a change over here and I hit compile, it's going to rerun the compiler, check for errors, generate some JavaScript code, and then run that JavaScript code over here on the right. There's a tiny little bit of HTML down here that's sort of setting up the, the back of the, um, like what's backing the actual JavaScript. So a couple things to note about this. Um, so the sort of the nominal purpose of Ellie is this share button, but uh, so you can share little code snippets with one another. Um, but the, the cooler stuff is that you can kind of see a little window into what it's like using Elm for like normal uh, development. So this format button is pretty cool. So there's a, I don't know if you've ever used Go format or in, or in JavaScript uh, Prettier, but basically uh, in Elm, there's this one common formatting library. And when I make a bunch of changes like this, and then I hit the format button, Wi-Fi permitting, <laughs> Let's see, maybe I need to, am I connected? This is one of those things where you do a live demo and then you check things right before you start and then maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. Compile, okay, so that worked. And now I'm gonna mess stuff up. Format, there we go, okay. Um, sorry about that, little Wi-Fi blip. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so it has this sort of consistent formatting scheme, and the, and the idea here is to uh, prevent you from having to spend time thinking about style. So one of the coolest parts about Elm format is that there are no configuration options, zero. And that's a very intentional design feature. And what it does is it prevents teams from having arguments about style configurations. So you can't argue about like how to configure your tabs or how to configure your like line lengths, anything, anything like that. It's just all baked right in. Um, and this is sort of like the, the consistent community standard. Uh, so everybody on our team has Elm format set to run on save. So as soon as you're done, you just hit save and then everything just lines up. It's pretty great. Um, there's also the, the, the fork button, which is if you wanna, again, if you wanna share things. Um, but the real exciting part about what Elm gets you is really comes down to the compiler and that's what this uh, compile button does. So let's say I wanna change the size of this. If I wanted to change 400 to 200, okay, that would work fine. We, we expect that to work. What happens if I change 200 to something that doesn't make sense, like cats? Okay. So I'm going to compile this, and it's going to say type mismatch. The argument to function size is causing a mismatch. Size is expecting it to be two ints, but it is an int and a string. Right? So, so the compiler says, okay, I understand that those are, are uh, you know, two different things, and you can't do that. Okay. But a, a pretty common source of runtime exceptions is null pointer exceptions in Java, or, or undefined is not a function in JavaScript, you know, lot, lots of different uh, cases where you think you've actually got something to work with, but it turns out you don't. So what happens if I try to compile this? Cannot find variable null. And the suggestions here are kind of revealing. It says maybe you want one of the following, area.fill, html.ul, label.fill, list.all. Like why isn't it suggesting null? Well, the answer is that Elm doesn't have null, or undefined, or nil, or anything like any of those. Um, so there's this great quote from Sir Tony Hoare uh, where he, he talks about uh, sort of how he popularized null back in Algol W. And he calls it his billion dollar mistake because he thinks that over the years, null has caused over a billion dollars in economic damage. And uh, he considers it a mistake to have introduced it in the first place. So it turns out that uh, there are other ways to represent the absence of a value and those alternative ways um, let the compiler help you out more and let you make sure that you're handling all the cases where you need them to, to be handled. Um, so Elm doesn't have null, doesn't have undefined. So that entire category of runtime crashes just goes away. So um, some other things to note, on the left here we have some packages. So we have elmlang slash core, elmlang slash html, elmlang slash hcg, and Teresa slash elmplot. Um, so Elm has its own package manager. Uh, you can add packages right here through Ellie, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, 
one thing to note is that Elm doesn't reuse the existing uh, JavaScript ecosystem. It actually has its own separate ecosystem with a completely different set of guarantees that's based around this compiler. Okay, so how are we actually getting from this compiled code, um, this, this Elm code, to this plot? Like, how does Elm deal with rendering things if it doesn't use the built-in you know, baseline things that JavaScript does? Let's talk about that. So the, the fundamental thing uh, to understand about how Elm makes interactive uh, UIs is the view function. So view is basically a function that takes some arguments and returns a virtual DOM. So a virtual DOM is this idea that was popularized by React, and it's basically the idea of describing how you want the page to look. So the DOM being the document object model, the, the, the browser's representation of the page. And so uh, when you look at something like this, this is a function called view. It takes one argument called state, could be any argument you want, could be multiple arguments, doesn't matter. The important part, though, is that it's returning this virtual DOM description of how we want the page to look. And these right here, these are just plain old Elm functions. So div is a function, h1 is a function, p is a function. So this div is sort of the, the container around all this. This h1 has the text, hello devox, so that's this. Um, there's a paragraph here with some more text. This is a chart built with Elm plot. And you notice that even something much more complicated, like this entire interactive plot, is also just a function call. Right, so I don't have to do any kind of like special, like this is a special templating thing or like JSX or anything like that. It's all just built into the language, just functions. So how do you get something interactive out of that? Obviously, this, there's, there's more going on here. This is, uh, this is not just built into uh, you know, uh, JavaScript. This is, this is custom logic here. So how do you get interactivity out of just a view function? So the answer is the Elm architecture. So the view, the view function is actually only part of this architecture. It's the part that does the rendering, but it's not the part that does the interaction. So ultimately, when you compile Elm to JavaScript, uh, it sets up this runtime, the Elm runtime. And the runtime is in charge of doing all sorts of different things, like dealing with event listeners, uh, performing side effects. There's just like the whole category of things that are sort of relegated to the runtime, such that you can write your Elm programs in terms that don't need to deal with any of those things. So the Elm runtime deals with the Elm architecture and translates it into a running interactive program. So uh, at the top, you have your model. So the model represents your entire application state. And as we will see shortly, I really do mean your entire application state. It's one single immutable value, one source of truth for the entire application's state. Then you have a view function. So the runtime will actually pass your current model to the view and say, look, I need, uh, here's the current state of the world, our, our entire application state, render this. You can break view down, because it's a function, into other functions, right? So you can have one view function at the top, and it can call out to lots and lots of smaller view functions. And as your program gets bigger and bigger, that sort of tree of functions uh, sort of evolves naturally. Uh, view returns some virtual DOM that describes how we want the page to look. And the runtime says, great, I now got that description of how you want the page to look. I'm going to take care of making the actual DOM look that way. Now, part of that could be event listeners, right? We could say, I want you to react when something, uh, when the user clicks, or when the user moves the mouse, or when the user does this or that. Um, importantly, though, the way that those are specified are not in terms of callbacks. The way they're specified is in terms of messages. So a message is just a value. It's a piece of data. And the runtime is actually going to send that data to a different function called update. So when the user clicks, it's not firing a callback. All it's doing is saying, hey, runtime, here's a description of what I want you to do in response to that click. Just go ahead and send that to the update function. So the runtime says, cool, update, here's the message that describes what the user did. And then also, here's the current model, the current state of the world. And what I want you to do, the update function's job, is to return a new model. It says, like, here's the new state of the world, and also as a separate value, potentially any uh, effects that it wants the Elm runtime to perform. So this gives us a new model based on user input. And then finally closing the loop, uh, the runtime says, OK, cool, now I've got my new model, my new state of the world. I'm going to run that through view again to get some new virtual DOM, which describes the new page as I want it to look. And then finally, the runtime says, I'm going to diff the current virtual DOM that you just gave me with the previous one that I had from the last time we ran through this loop. And it can do that really efficiently, really quickly. Same thing that React does and say, cool, I'm going to produce just the minimal set of updates necessary to the DOM to affect that change, to, to make the DOM actually reflect what's going on there. So all of this happens really quickly. As it turns out, there are benchmarks uh, you can read about on the Elm website's blog. Um, if you benchmark this approach versus like React and Ember and Angular on like the 2MVC application, Elm's benchmarks are actually faster. 
So even though it's doing all of this with just immutable data and just pure functions, like view just returns a value, just takes some arguments and returns a value, update also just takes some, some arguments and returns a value, even though this entire system is just ba based on immutable data and pure functions, it's still actually really fast in practice, at least fast enough for, uh, to make nice web applications. Granted, of course, you can always fine tune, like hand tune JavaScript to be, uh, to be faster because at the end of the day, Elm compiles down to JavaScript. But the point being, you know, even for very large applications like ours, this scales really, really well. Okay, but this is an unusual way to handle application state, right? Like back in the day when we were just using JavaScript and possibly jQuery, it was kind of normal to just store a lot of your application state like right in the DOM itself, just like put little at attributes on elements and then read them back out and use global variables. And eventually we kind of figured out, uh, you know, this, this is like okay in the small, but when you start to get more and more complicated after JavaScript started getting fast enough to move a lot of your logic to the client where you can get a better user experience, um, this didn't scale very well. So we kind of moved on, and, and today I think most systems do what React does, which is to say you have stateful components which can hold on to their own state and manage it, sort of object-oriented notion of uh, things that manage their own state, um, and then stores, which are also separate sources of truth for the application state. Um, Redux, which is actually uh, based on the Elm architecture, uh, it's a story that I guess not a lot of people know, but uh, let's look it up sometime, Dan Abramov's interviews about Redux and, and the origins, but um, basically uh, says we'll just have one store, uh, but you can still have components uh, with their own individual state. But Elm is the only one that I'm aware of that really takes a hard line on saying, oh, our application state is really just one immutable value. Like that is the single source of truth and there is no alternative. So Elm doesn't have mutable globals in the language. You can't, you can't use them, that's not a feature. Um, it doesn't have components, it doesn't have stores. It's just this one immutable value for the model, that's it. So what does this do for debugging? So let me give you an example. So this right here is our create assignment form. Uh, so this is what teachers use when they want to assign something to students. Um, so this is written in Elm, and uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? So you can expand and collapse list of students, you can select all these different uh, possible types of things, which reveals more and more things. You select content, it brings out this whole other thing. Um, we can look at all these different things. I can search for like noun and say, okay, identifying parts of speech, cool, I'll check that out. Maybe check, uncheck some of these. We can see a syncing in the background there. There's just a lot, a lot of logic here. Um, as you can imagine, when you have <laughs> this much logic, um, even when you have a compiler that's preventing things from crashing, you still just sometimes make logic mistakes, right? You write something that compiles and it's valid, but at the end of the day, when you have this much business logic, it's, it's pretty easy to make mistakes. So uh, here's how uh, Elm handles debugging. So this right here, I hit that little explore history button in the, in the corner. Um, this is only available when you compile your program in debug mode. So all those messages that are coming through, normally those are just part of the process and they get garbage collected. But in debug mode, they don't. In debug mode, they get saved. They get remembered in memory. That would be pretty inefficient for production, but for debugging, it's really great. Because what I can do now is I can just go back in time and say, okay, here's what happened when this message came through, here's what happened when this message came through, and I can just replay all the stuff that I just did. And because Elm has everything in this application state, this one immutable value, this just works. Right? There's no other sources of truth here. There's no like, missing information. It's just what's in the DOM and then what's in your application state. And I can just like, expand and collapse all of this. Right? I, I can just look at any part of my model at any point in time and just see exactly what the values were. So instead of having to like, go through and set up watches and things like that, it's just it's all right here. There's, there's nothing else to it. There's nothing else to watch. The other cool thing about this is uh, what it means for QA. So if I hit resume here, um, I can now, uh, in addition to hitting explore history, I can also hit export. So this actually downloads everything we just saw in a serialized format, and now I can actually, I can switch browsers, go over here to Firefox, so if I go uh, explore history here, we have nothing, right, because I haven't done anything in Firefox yet. Um, but I can now import this, and uh, just import that history, and now everything's, everything's back, right? So this means if I'm trying to communicate, or even say to a coworker, uh, where I've got somebody who's you know, saying, hey, I, I can reproduce this problem locally, can you see what I'm seeing? And I say, uh, I, I don't know, what are the steps to reproduce? And they don't have to tell me the steps to reproduce, they can just send me this and say, here, <laughs> this is exactly how you reproduce it. Not only that, but because all this is doing is it's replaying these messages, I can actually make code changes as long as they don't change how the messages are structured. Um, and then I can still replay these on top of that code. And actually, the, the debugger is smart enough to say, if you try to import something and the code has diverged too far and it's no longer replayable, it'll tell you. But if it is replayable, then I'll say, cool, here you go. I, I, I can make it so you can replay everything, actually confirm that the bug is fixed, confirm that it's no longer reproducible. 
And again, this is possible because of the way the Elm architecture is oriented. But there are some downsides here in terms of learning, right? So when you're switching from this object-oriented mindset where you have like components and state that's managed in multiple different sources of truth uh, versus this purely functional style, um, it takes some getting used to. Um, so the fact that Elm has no components means that you have sort of a new way to learn about how to, do, uh, how to accomplish reuse. And uh, for a lot of people, that, that takes time to learn, right? It's a mindset shift. Um, and whenever you have a different paradigm to learn, there's a cost, right? So this is not something that uh, we, we took on for free. There are a lot of things that you know, immediately got better, but the paradigm shift definitely requires an investment. Um, another thing that takes some getting used to is if you're used to JavaScript where everything is dynamically typed, um, just switching to a type-checked world like Elm can also be an adjustment, right? Um, the benefit is that you get the sort of, if it compiles, it usually just works. Now that's not true of all type systems, but it generally tends to be the sentiment that people feel in Elm. Like once you get your program compiling, it tends to be that it just works. Of course you can make business logic errors, um, but in practice it seems to be pretty representative of the experience that people have. Um, and this does mean that uh, you get cheaper refactoring, which in turn means that you get less technical debt. Right? So technical debt tends to accumulate less when refactoring is cheaper like this. So we found that there's a significant chunk of our old JavaScript code base where it's kind of like nobody wants to touch it. It's sort of like we know that needs a refactor, but eh, I really don't want to touch that code. I don't know what evil spirits it will release. But that doesn't tend to happen in Elm code. I mean, people have the confidence to refactor. So if you've got some Elm code and you're like, you know what, this has kind of gotten big and bloated. I want to just like split this up and simplify it. Um, you can do that. And in fact, we, we have no compunction about saying even like the most junior member of our team who just joined, you can just say, yeah, just go ahead. Like if it compiles, it usually just works. So we have this confidence that like, unless they're you know, uh, doing something really wild and out there, like yeah, it's, it's fine to just make refactors. And so the code base ends up being cleaner because it's easier to clean. Now, having said this, because of its dynamic type system, it is quicker to get something up on the screen in JavaScript. Right? So if I'm trying to make a prototype and just trying to knock something out, um, there's no doubt that if I have two scenarios and all else being equal in one scenario, I don't have to go through these checks. I don't have to deal with these errors. Um, that's just going to be faster to get something up and running. But over the course of, in our case, we've found it to be about a month. Um, if you have a project that's at all longer lived than that, um, even, even just a month long project, you're gonna have overall higher velocity in Elm. That's what we've found. So the same project, doing it like the same team that granted once they've been ramped up on Elm, they understand it, they will actually get the project done in less time and the result will be more maintainable. So that's been a, definitely a, a worthwhile trade-off from our perspective. Um, now, all of this is not to say that uh, we have 100% Elm code, right? Elm is the majority of our code base, in fact, the vast majority of our code base, in fact, our front-end engineers spend about 95% of their time writing Elm code, but there is some need, at least in our case, and in fact in most companies that I talk to, to do some amount of interop with JavaScript. Right? Elm is a much newer language, the library ecosystem is not as big, um, so interoperating with JavaScript is, to some extent, inevitable. In fact, even on this, this thing, <laughs> if I scroll down here, um, almost everything on this page is Elm, except for this little uh, date time picker right here. And even though we, we ended up with all sorts of uh, really nice libraries that, that were sort of off the shelf in Elm, uh, we couldn't quite find a date time picker that we liked. So this is jQuery right here. So it's, this page is basically 95% Elm and then just a little bit of jQuery. Okay, probably more than 95%. But um, actually there are now some, uh, <laughs> some nice Elm uh, date time pickers that have come out since we did this and uh, we haven't gotten around to switching, but um, this little thing caused us <laughs> surprisingly, uh, a surprisingly high percentage of the bugs on this page just because it's uh, jQuery rather than uh, Elm. But interoperating with JavaScript is not only possible, but it's important, um, at least in practice. It's also important to note how Elm does this. So Elm code talks to JavaScript the same way that it talks to servers, which is to say just by sending data to and from it. So if you think about it, let's say I have a server written in Ruby, which in fact uh, that is our backend, is in Ruby. If I'm talking from my Elm code to my Ruby code, I don't really have to worry about Ruby breaking any of Elm's guarantees, right? There's no code sharing there. That's not really possible. So what that means is that if I'm talking to JavaScript the same way, then I have that same invariant, right? If I'm just sending data to JavaScript and then receiving data back from JavaScript, there's no possibility for the JavaScript to impact the guarantees of my Elm code. These are sort of sectioned off. So this is a little bit more work, right? It's definitely easier to just call a function in the middle of, of any other function um, than it is to talk back and forth with data. And so this is how most languages that compile to JavaScript interoperate with JavaScript is 
if, 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 they're, if I'm in the middle of one of their function calls and I decide that I want to run some JavaScript, they will permit me to do that. They'll say, you can just call it to a JavaScript function anywhere you want. Now, this is convenient, but the downside is that you can no longer rely on your guarantees to the same level that you can with Elm. So I think that this interop uh, approach is, is a big contributor to how we've been able to avoid runtime exceptions. Is just that when something goes wrong, it's isolated, right? The JavaScript is kept completely separate from the Elm code, so we can really quickly tell where problems are when they happen. It's sort of the idea of JavaScript as a service. And so far, at least for us, uh, it's, it's been a, a big benefit in terms of reliability. Now, uh, let's talk about the huge JavaScript ecosystem that this unlocks, because on the one hand, we do want to maintain our guarantees. It's really important that our Elm code stays easy to refactor and stays easy to debug like this. But it also is important that we have access to that huge ecosystem. That ecosystem, at least for us, uh, pretty much lives on NPM. And I think that's true of most JavaScript developers these days. Like there was a while where, like Bower kind of had a run and still is unfortunately necessary for web components and a few other things. But, um, but pretty much this means NPM. So uh, NPM, um, obviously much, much bigger than the Elm package ecosystem, no doubt. I mean, it's, it's enormous, right? It's, it's uh, probably the biggest <laughs> package ecosystem of the world at this point. Um, I'd be surprised to learn that it wasn't. Um, and uh, not only does it let you publish JavaScript, but you can also publish binaries, other things. You, you can publish pretty much anything you want to NPM. Um, there's also another thing about NPM that uh, I don't hear talked about very often, which is that if I install an NPM package, I say like NPM install and then the name of this package I want to get, that package that I'm installing is not just going to give me some code that I can add to my project. It can also run a post install script. And that post install script uh, is just arbitrary Node.js code. Which means anytime you install a package from NPM, and certainly when you hit NPM install and download a bunch of packages, they're all potentially running these things, who knows how many key loggers you're getting? We're all just extremely vulnerable to this. That's just a fact. And this hasn't blown up in our faces yet, but it seems wild to me the notion that that will never blow up in our faces. I think it's pretty much just a matter of time. Um, I don't know why we're not talking about this, but we probably should be. <laughs> Um, how many times a day do you hit npm install and just watch it download all the packages? Have you checked all the code to make sure that they're not malicious? I don't. <laughs> um, fortunately, uh, Elm package does not have that feature. So uh, when you install a package from Elm package, really all you get is some Elm code that you can add to your project, and that's it. It's not actually capable of running scripts like that. From my perspective, this is wonderful for peace of mind. Um, another thing about Elm package is that it supports Elm code, but not arbitrary JavaScript. So what this means is, let's say I want to make a new Elm package. And I'm like, OK, cool. I'm going to build this thing, and I'm going to publish it. And I write some Elm code, and I hit publish. And it's like, cool, thanks. Here you go. Congratulations. You've, you've published your first package. And then I start to do some JavaScript interop with that package. And I hit, try to hit publish again. It says, nope, sorry. Uh, this is just for Elm code. That's, that's what this, this repository is for. So you can do JavaScript interop for your application, but you can't just sort of like wrap an existing JavaScript library and pu publish it. And again, this is on purpose, right? This is, this is the goal is to create an ecosystem where these guarantees are maintained. And you can't possibly maintain those guarantees if it's possible for you to publish JavaScript. The goal is to make an ecosystem of Elm stuff where all of these guarantees are respected. One concrete benefit of this is what it means for versioning. So in JavaScript, you have no notion of semantic versioning other than a social contract, right? You can say, please follow this semantic versioning scheme. If you make a breaking change, please bump the major version number. But Elm package actually takes this a step further. It actually enforces it automatically. So if I publish that package, and then I make a breaking change, where I, I delete some arguments from a function, or have it return something else, or delete a function, um, and I try to hit publish again after only bumping the minor version number, it says, nope, sorry, this is a breaking change. Like if somebody else tries to compile against your code, it's going to break, because you, you change the public facing API. You need to bump the major version number. So this is enforced across the entire ecosystem. Like Every package in Elm package has this enforced. So there's this really consistent versioning scheme, which makes the difference in the upgrade experience. Like When you go to upgrade your Elm package, it's very different from the experience in NPM. I talked to a lot of people recently who have been complaining about how they upgrade something in NPM, and a bunch of stuff breaks. And it just takes a lot of hair pulling and, and time to just sort of work through all that and debug their way through all that. Whereas in Elm package, uh, it's, it's very different. right? You, you upgrade, and Typically, if there's no major version bumps, you just, OK, everything just works again. Um, but even if something does change, then you can just kind of work through the compiler errors. And then once everything compiles again, it's, it's all good. So this is a very different experience. One of the, the, the quotes that I heard that sort of uh, most directly addressed this was um, 
Oh, sorry. Uh, skipped, skipped a slide. Um, we didn't switch to Elm because we were unhappy with React. We switched to Elm because we were unhappy with NPM. And uh, this, this definitely resonates with me. Um, so uh, the, the trade-off that this means, though, is that it means that there is less available off the shelf. Like there, there are fewer packages in the Elm ecosystem because it says, look, look we're, we're really trying to build something new here. We're trying to build something that's got a completely different set of characteristics. That doesn't mean there's going to be more do-it-yourself, right? Like more um, something where you just don't find an off-the-shelf solution, and you're either going to write it yourself or you're going to interoperate with the existing JavaScript one. Um, so, for example, if, if I wanted to write a wrapper around moment.js, which is a, a date manipulation library, um, I couldn't publish that. I, I couldn't do it. Um, I would instead have to write a date library in pure Elm. But actually, if you think about it, um, there are some nice consequences to this. So Elm plot is basically exists because uh, there's no wrapper around D3. Right? People wouldn't bother building a nice graphing library if they could just write bindings for D3. Because D3 is huge. It does a bunch of stuff. The idea of re-implementing D3 in a new language sounds very daunting. But fortunately, Teresa didn't do that. What she did instead was she said, OK, I want to do some graphing in Elm. There isn't an off-the-shelf graphing solution. I'm going to start from scratch and just think about how nice of a graphing solution can I make. And so this API is not D3's API. This is an API that's tailored to be nice in Elm. It's using Elm's immutable data structures under the hood instead of the JavaScript ones, which would have to convert back and forth. All of this is optimized to give you the best experience possible in Elm. And the results are really great. Like, this is, this is a wonderful library. It's easy to use. It's got a nice API. And it looks great. And all of this exists because of that decision to say, yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to just wrap the existing stuff. We're actually going to try and do things in an Elm way. So this is optimizing for long-term ecosystem quality over short-term ecosystem size. So um, we've now sort of made it to full-scale Elm, but that's, that's not the normal situation, right? Most people are either not using Elm in production, or if they are, it's, it's sort of like very early days. And so a question that I get asked a lot is sort of, how do you get to this scale? How do you get to the point where everybody on the front end team is spending 95% of their time writing Elm? Um, and the answer that I give is that full-scale Elm begins with small-scale Elm. So what I mean by that is just ship something small and get it all the way into production just one small part of one, one page and get it into production. And this last part is really key because it, it forces you to answer all these questions that otherwise will stand as a sort of vague, fuzzy, intermediate, indefinite barrier between you and actually using Elm all the time. Questions like, how will we integrate it into our code? How will we teach it to our teammates, right? Realistically, the, the story that we hear about teams successfully integrating Elm is you have like one or two champions who are really excited about it. Everybody else on the team is kind of like, Sounds cool, but we, we're not really excited about it. We don't really know it. So there's going to be some teaching. That's inevitable. There's, there's always some story where people need to figure out how to teach their teammates how to get ramped up in this new system. Um, how will we build it? How will we deploy it? This was something that we sort of took for granted early on, right? We were like, oh, well, it, it works locally in our local dev environment, so that's, that's it, right? Case closed. Um, but we should have known better that, uh, of course, build systems are complicated, right? There's, there's a lot of moving parts there, and it's always going to be a little bit different how you build and deploy it from how you do it locally. But once you go through the actual work of deploying even something really small into production, it forces you to answer all these questions, right? You no longer worry about integrating it with your code base because you did. You no longer worry about teaching it to your teammates because you can just pair with one of them as you're going through and setting up this one small thing. And, and not to mention, you now have the context of being able to show them, look, this is this one part of our code base. You know how this works. It's not some abstract concept that, that they won't have anything concrete to latch onto. And building and deploying it, once it's in production, you've already had to go through that whole process. So this removes this barrier and makes it so that you can, instead of worrying about these things and having these, these question marks standing between you and where you want to get, you can instead say, OK, well, well, we'll just expand from there. We, we already got it in production. We'll just do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. It's exactly what we did. And that's how we got to 100,000 lines. Another important thing about this is that it lets you get away with introducing it in a way that involves minimal risk. So uh, a common thing that I hear is that people say, well, we're going to use Elm on our next big project. We've got this Greenfield project coming up, and like, that's when we're going to try out Elm. The problem with this is that that's actually really risky. Right? If you're betting your whole project on a technology that you've never used in production yet, like, that's actually a really big risk. Like, what if it doesn't go well? Right? Now all of a sudden, that entire project is, is sort of like tied to this thing that you, you don't really fully understand yet. The actually less risky approach, the more responsible thing, in my opinion, is to do it on something small where the cost of going back is low. So if you're just working on this one small thing and say we're going to get it into production, 
the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, you can always go back. You can always just say, well, we tried it and we decided not to use it, right? It's, it's very low cost. But although it is minimal risk, there is a major potential reward, right? If, if it succeeds, if, you, if this little project does make it into production and it takes and people like it and they're happy with it, you can then just expand and expand and expand. And then over time, this pays off way, way, way more than the, the initial risk and the initial cost. So um, how will we build it? Uh, I can answer that for us. So initially, we built it with uh, sprockets, which is uh, sort of the Rails asset pipeline. So our back end is Ruby on Rails. Um, so we initially did a sprockets integration, um, but then uh, we had all sorts of problems with that, um, that, that we were not happy with it, not just for Elm, but for things in general. Um, and so we ended up switching to a Webpack loader, and that's still what we're using today. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, so there's quite a few different um, build tool integrations, so Webpack, Grunt, Gulp, um, sort of like all the, all the big names. But at the end of the day, if you have something custom, you can always fall back on Elm Make, which is the compiler. Um, so all of these things are just basically uh, interfaces to Elm Make, which is just like, give me some Elm files, I will spit out some JavaScript for you. So you can always fall back on that. Um, another question I get asked a lot is sort of like, why not use fill in the blank here instead? This is a great question, right? There are a lot of different front-end technologies out there, um, a lot of great ones, and, and they have a lot of different um, trade-offs. And so uh, let me just uh, explain why, why we're using Elm instead of some of the alternatives. Um, one reason is delay. This is just like an extremely warm and fuzzy and impossible to quantify word, but I, I think it's the only like, fair way to describe how happy it's made our team. Um, I'll just give you one example of this. Um, so this is from a tweet that somebody made uh, saying that this was the best error message he'd ever seen. This is, this is an er error message from the Elm compiler. It says, alias problem. This type alias is recursive, forming an infinite type. Um, so you can see on here, type alias node equals, so this is basically saying, uh, whenever I write the word node, here's what I mean. And it's saying, okay, we have an x, which is an int, and a y, which is also an int, and children, which is a list of nodes. Then it's like, okay, wait a minute, list of nodes, what's a node? Oh, a node is an X and a Y and a children, which is a list of nodes. Wait, what's a node? Oh, okay, node is a, right? So that's the problem. This is, this is a compiler error. This is when I expand a recursive type alias, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So de-aliasing results in an infinitely large type. Try this instead, and then it gives a little workaround. It says, this is kind of a subtle distinction. I suggested the naive fix, but you can often do something a bit nicer. So I would recommend reading more at, and then a link. Um, so the person commented, like, this is the nicest error message I've ever seen. And, to be perfectly honest, I mean, th this is kind of like where the bar is for Elm error messages. Like, the compiler really, I I'm pretty comfortable saying, sets the gold standard. Like, I, I have been reading more and more blog posts about different languages saying, we're trying to make our error messages more like Elms, and this is why. Like, it's, it's really nice working in this all day. Um, uh, there was a, a, a quote, uh, somebody re replied to the tweet, uh, that should be an inspiration for every error message. And this is someone who you may have heard of who, who kind of has some experiences with uh, type check languages. This was John Carmack commenting on this. So uh, definitely agree with uh, Mr. Carmack on that one. It's, it's, it's really nice. Um, so delight is one, reliability is the other. Um, and so uh, I want to talk about a couple of different classes of languages that have various different uh, alternatives to reliability and uh, what sort of set Elm, sets Elm apart from them. Um, so TypeScript, Flow, and Dart are all languages, uh, or, or I guess Flow is just a type checker, um, that sort of introduce, without changing JavaScript semantics uh, a ton, a type system. So a, a common thing that people ask is like, well, why would I use Elm if I could just have TypeScript plus ImmutableJS plus Babel, or not, not Babel in TypeScript's case, but, um, it, you know, but basically, wh why can't I just like do a build my own Elm? Why is that, you know, what's the difference? Um, so let's talk about TypeScript for a second. Um, so here's some TypeScript code. This is like the try TypeScript website. Uh, so I've got a little bit of TypeScript code here on the left. It says var greeting equals hello devox. Say alert greeting.trim. I can hit run. Let's see how the Wi-Fi is doing. Great. Hello devox. Um, so that's, that's all this code does. Now what I can also do is I can also add a type annotation to this, right? I can say this is a string. And that will compile. Great. Uh, hello devox. Cool. Um, now I can also do another thing, which is I can say var original colon string, and then I can set this to be equal to original. So all I've done here is I've just introduced a new variable, and I'm just passing it through. Original is a string, it's called hello devox. Uh, greeting is also a string, which is just set equal to original. So hopefully this will still run, of course, great. Um, now let's say uh, I want to change this. So I, I change this to from hello devox to five. Okay, now this should not compile, which it doesn't, which is great because there's a type mismatch, right? It says type five is not assignable to type string, var original string, right? So um, that's correct, right? That five is not a string. And in fact, if I were to try and run this code, it would crash. Like it would try, try to call trim on five. Five does not have a method called trim. So this would crash. So it's a good thing the compiler caught this. 
Excellent. Now I'm going to change this string to any. And now it compiles. Everything's fine. Nothing is broken. And when I run it, sure enough, runtime exception. Greeting that trim is not a function. Yeah, sure enough, it, it doesn't have that function. So what happened here? Why, why did this work? Why did, why did TypeScript accept my code and then crash? Well, the answer is the, the any keyword, right? So the, the any type is this magical escape hatch that says, JK, just kidding about everything. Um, trust me, I know what I'm doing. But I did not know what I was doing. I, I told it I knew what I was doing and I was wrong. Um, and so the result was a crash. Uh, so um, the any keyword is sort of this big escape hatch that makes things sort of um, more convenient short term but less reliable long term. Right? So like any, any code that I write that uses any is susceptible to crashing in this way. Also, any library code that I import that uses any is susceptible to crashing in this way. Also, I have no way of telling which, if any, of my library code is using any. So you can say, like, just don't use it. Like, just have a rule on your team, never use any. And then you can also say, just have a linter rule that says absolutely nobody on your team can use any. But uh, it's pretty hard to say, also don't use any libraries that use it. Because that basically closes you off from the whole ecosystem. Consider uh, definitely type. So this is the repository for high quality TypeScript type definitions. Um, it's called definitely typed, which uh, would, would, at least for me, I, I read that as um, everything in here is definitely typed. Um, but any is actually considered part of its best practices. Like it actually has a whole section on their, on their webpage about how to use any properly in, uh, in this ecosystem. And the problem with that is that any is not definitely typed. Actually, that's its whole point, is to say this is not definitely typed. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. But that means that anything you get from definitely typed or from, from any TypeScript code um, potentially is just has these like lurking runtime exceptions. Again, Elm doesn't have this. Elm doesn't have any. Elm doesn't have that escape hatch. It says, no, no, seriously, we're going to take reliability really, really seriously. Um, so these will give you, I, I absolutely grant, less crashing than plain JavaScript. Like there, there are ways that you can do checks ahead of time to prevent certain types of crashes. But if you really, really want this zero runtime exceptions that we've got for almost two years at this point um, running, you know, running Elm, I, I think there's really kind of like only one place you can go. Now, uh, another reasonable question is, okay, but what about a different functional programming language, right? There, there are alternatives that, that diverge from JavaScript semantics like Elm does um, that will also compile to JS. So uh, why not them? I should preface this by saying that like, I think FP languages that compile to JS on the whole are pretty sweet. And um, I'm not saying this to discourage anyone from using them, but I would at least like to compare, you know, uh, like why not use them uh, instead of Elm? So if you like Haskell, you should probably check out PureScript or GHCJS. Um, so PureScript is sort of designed from the ground up to be compiled to JavaScript. It has very Haskell-like semantics. GHCJS is literally a subset of Haskell ported to uh, JavaScript, so it's even closer to Haskell. Um, if you like OCaml, you should probably check out either uh, Reason or BuckleScript. So Reason is just a syntax on top of OCaml that makes it more sort of JavaScript flavored um, and does some other things. Um, BuckleScript compiles OCaml code to JavaScript, so putting the two together, you can get OCaml code that compiles to JavaScript. Um, Scala, if you like Scala, you will be surprised to learn that you should check out Scala.js. Um, and if you like Clojure, again, big surprise, ClojureScript uh, might be of interest to you. Um, so how do these compare to Elm? Like, uh, uh, so ClojureScript um, does the same kind of optional typing, like there's a core.typed module, but um, again, it's, it's sort of off by default. All the APIs are, are defined in terms of dynamic typing, so kind of the same boat as like TypeScript, Dart, et cetera. Um, so uh, if you really want like the no runtime exceptions experience, um, this is probably not uh, the right place to look. Um, Scala.js has uh, a type system, but it does have the, the, the billion dollar mistake, right? Null. Um, so again, you can make a rule saying don't use it, but you know, libraries that you use are still probably going to have it. Um, and that's a potential source of crashes. Um, neither PureScript nor Reason does have uh, null built into the language, but all four of these, it's true that anything can run arbitrary JavaScript code. Right, so I talked earlier about how Elm's interop system is designed to isolate JavaScript code so that your guarantees are really, really solid inside your Elm code. But all four of these don't have that. They have the typical FFI story where the idea is that in the middle of any function in any of these languages, you can just call arbitrary JavaScript code, at which point kind of all bets are off when it comes to reliability and, and enforcing those guarantees. So um, really, if, if you want this experience, there really is only one place that you could go, at least at this point in time. Uh, maybe that will change in the future. But for now, uh, it's really just Elm that, that takes reliability that, that degree of seriously. Um, another question I get a lot is, how will we hire anyone? Like, this is a new language, right? This is a, a relatively, uh, like, small hiring pipeline, right? Like, how many people out there really know Elm, really are using Elm? 
Um, so we hired 11 developers in 2016, and uh, nine of them actually cited Elm as a reason for applying. So it might surprise you to learn that actually um, hiring was much harder before we used Elm. We're actually not sure how we ever did it before. So it turns out that although there is a relatively small number of people who already know Elm, there's actually a pretty large number of people who want to learn Elm or who want to be using it in production. And as long as you're okay with having them ramp up, and we found it easy enough to ramp up that we actually have uh, our, our you know, people, we've hired people straight out of boot camps who write Elm in the first week. Um, this can be absolutely fine. Um, and as for why we get such a volume of job applicants, um, think about this. Which, which of these job posts stand out? Hiring for React, Redux, Mule.js, Babel, hiring for Angular 2, TypeScript, Lambda, or want to write Elm all day? It's a pretty compelling pitch, right? There's probably some people in this room who just thought, yeah, that does actually sound pretty good. Um, by the way, we're hiring, uh, if you're interested in that. And uh, that's, that's pretty much all we have to do in order to, to get way more job applicants than we ever did before on our front end positions. Um, another question is how will we teach it, right? Um, so obviously more new hires are going to know React than Elm. Um, but we have actually found, since we do know React from back in the days when it was new, and basically we were hiring people who did not know React who had to get ramped up, it's a pretty similar time to becoming a, a production contributor, comparing someone who doesn't know React and has to learn that, because remember, there's a whole ecosystem that goes with React, um, versus someone who uh, doesn't know Elm and is getting up to speed on that. And to be honest, I, I think a big part of the reason that it's the same, or, or at least similar, um, is that the compiler aids beginner learning a lot. Like obviously you're learning a whole new language with new semantics, there's a lot more to learn, but you also get a lot more help with those really friendly error messages. Those help beginners a lot. Okay, finally, I uh, just wanna give you some resources to if, if you're interested in learning more about Elm. Um, Guide.elmlang.org is sort of the official guide. That's uh, always a great place to get started. Um, there's a blog post called How to Use Elm at Work on the Elm website that specifically talks about like how to uh, go from having an all JS code base to introducing Elm. Um, shameless plug, I'm writing a book, Elm in Action for Manning Publications. Um, it's uh, about, uh, not, not all the way done yet, but uh, you can read several chapters already. Um, there's training available. Um, I can recommend three people. Luke Westby at hum HumbleSpark. He's actually the creator of Ellie. Um, which is written in Elm, by the way. Uh, Brian Hicks uh, at Asterisk, he created Elm Benchmark, which is like the awesome benchmarking library. Um, Chris Jenkins uh, from London, he created uh, Elm Remote Data, which is a popular library for dealing with remote data. Um, there's a podcast uh, called Elm Town, run by Murphy Randall. He's awesome, he's a great host. Um, got a dozen or so episodes at this point, probably lots more coming out. Um, there's a very beginner-friendly community out there. Uh, so the Reddit uh, subreddit has a weekly beginner questions thread. It's just sort of like, hey, just come ask easy questions and you know, people will answer them. Um, there's an Elm Slack with like, a lot of members, a really helpful beginners channel. Um, and finally, uh, lots of meetups. So we, uh, they, they like to customize the Elm logo to fit their, uh, <laughs> their, their local meetup style. Some of these are pretty creative. Um, and, uh, and also uh, community events in the form of conferences. So we just had uh, ElmConf in St. Louis um, back in September. There's gonna be another one next year also attached to Strange Loop. Um, Elm Europe in Paris is coming up in June. Uh, there are still tickets available for that, I believe, but I know it's capped, so uh, <laughs> gotta be careful about that. Um, so finally, if you're wondering, how can our team do this? Like, how can we get this going? Um, remember, full-scale Elm begins with small-scale Elm. So ship something small, get it into production, watch it grow. Thanks very much. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Yeah, what's the mobile story? Um, so I guess implicit in that question is like, what's the, how do you make stuff really small and like lazy load and only load the the resources necessary. Because I mean, other than that, it's like, it's just JavaScript that it's compiling to. So um, that's actually the focus of the current release is asset management. So the goal is to make um, like code splitting with lazy loading, like really, really easy, um, server-side rendering if that's necessary. Uh, that's like, so probably gonna be coming out this summer. Um, and because a lot of people have asked that question. So yeah, that's, uh, that's very much the focus of the current release. Yeah. And uh, server-side. Uh, so, so there's server-side rendering, which is, uh, an easy problem, and then there's Elm on the server side, which is a really big project um, if you want to do a good job at it. So basically, uh, Evan Shiplicki, who's the creator of Elm, um, he sort of said that uh, if we're going to do Elm on the server side, he, he wants to be really ambitious about it and not just say, this is Elm except literally on the server. He wants to say, like, how do we make a really great server side experience, like from the ground up? 
Um, and so uh, there's like a lot of design work, a lot of questions about like what's the right target platform. So Elm is really serious about concurrency, um, which is kind of wasted in the browser because it's single threaded. Uh, but it is designed at least to have really powerful concurrency abstractions on the server someday. So then the question becomes, what do you want to compile it to? Um, if you compile it to JavaScript, you're still only getting one thread, and so you're wasting a lot of that. Um, so it seems like some alternative makes sense. Which alternative? Um, so there's, there's a lot of questions out there. So to make a long story short, I think that's a couple years off. Um, but I think uh, when it does land, it's going to be uh, much more than just you know, letting you write the same language on client and server, which is awesome. But it's also going to be, hopefully, um, an awesome language in its own right. At least that's the goal. Yeah? Oh, yeah, we've, we've, we've gone through many upgrades. Um, so we're on Elm 0.18. When we started, it was 0.15. Uh, so I guess we've gone through four like major breaking changes. Um, so basically, uh, number one, the compiler helps out a lot. Number two, there are um, like community tools that help out. So the most recent one, there was called, one called Elm Upgrade. And it basically, like there were some syntax changes. And it just like went through all our code and just like upgraded the syntax and just changed it. Um, so. Uh, Long story short, uh, yes, there have been breaking changes to the language, and uh, no, they haven't been a huge problem. <laughs> yes? Um, so you mentioned like, um, that you created a product component mm -hmm. in Elm, rather than wrap these Well, I didn't, but <laughs> yes, someone else did. I would say it depends on what you're doing, right? So implicit in the like client server like metaphor of, <laughs> of, of relationships is that some things are easier to do than others, right? So in the same way that talking to servers, some things are just really easy, you just hit an endpoint and then it like gives you back what you want. If you need to do a lot of coordination, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, that gets more complicated. Um, so it really depends on what you're doing. So for visualizations, it usually tends to be fine um, because you can just say like, okay, here's the data that I want to visualize, go, and then I, I care about these four events. So just tell me when, when the user does these interactions and then I'll handle them. Um, but like I said, it really, so whereas if you're doing something like um, really heavy like numeric computing where you need to like some, I don't know, like uh, some cryptographic, I don't know, you probably shouldn't be doing cryptography in the browser, but um, something where you need to like call out to just like one function like over and over, um, that gets more trouble. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the main difference that I wanted to highlight there was just that like you can do that, you know, for your application. Like if you're just like, we have some code or we want to use this existing library, you can totally interoperate with that locally, but you can't publish it, right? So that's, that's the idea is like, let's, let's make an ecosystem that, uh, that has, respects this set of guarantees. Other questions? All right, and we're only slightly over on time. Thanks very much. <laughs>